I believe, however, that wonder is an experience that we have that stays with us. We, we tend to recognize that in a moment of wonder, the veil between us and, and something transcendent, something larger than ourselves becomes very thin. And I believe that's, that's really what we experience when we experience wonder. We recognize ourselves in the context of a much larger picture, a much larger story. John Booker is a strategist, communicator, and cultural mythologist based out of Hollywood, California. He is the author of six books and has worked with companies like HBO, DC Comics, The History Channel, and others. He has served as a consultant and writer for numerous film, television, and virtual reality projects. He's spoken around the world about using the power of story to reframe how individuals, organizations, cultures, and nations are viewed. Last week, he wrote a piece for the Joseph Campbell Foundation called Reawakening Wonder. And since it's Christmas, I thought I'd talk to him about wonder and about mythology and what those two things have to do with each other. You're listening to a small good thing. You're listening to a small good thing. listening to a small good thing. Small good thing. Small good thing. Good thing. Small good thing. With Steve Zell. With Steve Zell. John Booker. It's an honor to be on the show. Last week, John, you wrote a piece for the Joseph Campbell Foundation website. It was called Reawakening Wonder. And since this is the most wonderful time of the year, (laughs) I want to talk to you about wonder. But before I do that, I want to talk to you about you. Your Facebook page says you are a mythologist and storyteller. You call yourself a mythologist, which sort of sounds like alchemist. What is a mythologist and why does the world need mythologists? Mm. You know, this question uh, is asked of me a lot. And, I, you know, I think it's helpful to begin by defining, you know, mythology. And Joseph Campbell, the, the famous author and mythologist, was, was asked quite often um, to define mythology. And He always defined it the same way. He said, mythology is other people's religion. Um, I I think there's a lot of truth to that. We we tend to look at um, mythology as being a specialized study in the beliefs of other people. However, I really believe that a mythologist looks at the stories behind the stories that we all buy into as human beings. All of us buy into uh, a, a certain number of stories that we all sort of get behind as a as a, uh, a human race, and I am very interested in uh, in the the stories behind the the metaphors that we uh, use. So they explain the way that the world's the world works. I mean, when we look back. At ancient peoples, take the Greeks, for example, so much of their mythology was used to explain the way that the world worked the best that they could understand it. And I think we're still in that same business. I think we often, um, you know, develop our own mythologies in our day and age through different cultural mediums, whether it be film, television, uh, it might be politics, it it may be religion, but we... We have a number of different mediums and methods that we still rely on to explain why about the world. What does it mean to be a human being? Um, Who am I and what am I supposed to be doing here? And I think mythology helps us get at those basic universal human questions. And that's what I'm interested in doing. When we talk about why we're here and what is the, the meaning of life in our story, we are, in a certain sense, talking about theology, and I'll get, a, I'll get to that in a second. So what do you do, John, to spread the gospel of mythology? How are, <laughs> how are you functioning and, and practicing that in, in the world? What is it your, what's your day and business like? Yeah, I, I 
primarily am writing about mythological ideas and then speaking about mythological ideas. And sometimes that speaking takes place at conferences. Sometimes it takes place at film festivals. Many other times it, it's writing um, for the web or writing for, for books or print documents. I'm trying to communicate with people uh, about these ideas. Now, I, I <laughs> my life got much, much simpler when I stopped trying to narrow down who I was to a single job description. So I do consider myself a mythologist. However, I look at my work not just as mythology, but I look at my work as this massive creative ecosystem. I believe that I need new sources of life flowing into my ecosystem all the time. So sometimes I may be, um, you know, working uh, on a new project, producing a, a, a video project or a film. Other times I may be, you know, uh, writing on a new project. And then with any healthy ecosystem, you need to have waste uh, and the deadness flowing out of that ecosystem. So I also, you know, try and really keep an eye on the things that I am doing and see what needs to go. I, I think when you approach your work that way, number one, it's very mythological to approach your work that way. But number two, I think it also kept, keeps you in healthy balance with your own work so that it's not uh, something that uh, begins to hang like an albatross around your own neck, but instead becomes something that is life-giving uh, to you. And I, I think that's really what's important about my work is that I, I try and stay focused on those things that are life-giving to me and are bringing life to me. And if something's not bringing life to me, sometimes it's something that just has to be done. You know, paying bills is uh, uh, something that we all must do. However, um, I think we all have a certain amount of control over parts of our life that we can uh, choose what we're going to do with. You know, no, none of us have 24 hours every day that uh, belong to someone else. There's some portion of your day that belongs to you. And I believe what you do with that time, you know, says a lot about how you view the world and what you want the world to be. And so the time that I do have, I, I'm trying to, you know, make the, the most of that and make the best of that and make the world a better place. In the past, I don't know if you still are, I think you still are, you worked with screenwriters and scriptwriters for mm -hmm. television and movies. Do, do you still do that? I do, yeah. That's still a part of my work and, in, in, you know, doing mythological consultation. Mythology, you know, also helps us better understand storytelling. So um, I, I was looking uh, at uh, someone's script just this morning before we were uh, talking together and looking at uh, the, the various ways that this writer had uh, constructed a story in our modern day, but looking at all the mythological influence that was in the story and trying to help guide them into a better story. I'm going to ask you another question about myth and reality in a minute. But before I do that, John, at the top of the show, I mentioned that you just wrote an article for the Joseph Campbell Foundation called Reawakening Wonder. And by the way, a link to that wonderful piece in the show notes is going to go along with other links that you might want to refer people to. Here's one thing you said in that article, and I'm just going to quote it. Wonder was a recurring idea in Joseph Campbell's writing and a concept he took very seriously. He lays out this challenge for mythologies looking to assert themselves into our culture. Quoting Campbell, you say, Indeed, the first and most essential service of a mythology is this one, of opening the mind and heart to the utter wonder of all being. End mm. quote. John how do you define wonder? And can you unpack a little bit more about how wonder is related to myth? Mm. You know, wonder is something I've spent a great deal of time thinking about. And I, I think I went through a season of life where I felt like, you know, I had a regular practice of experiencing wonder when I was a child. But as I got older, moments of wonder seemed more rare. They, they seemed to be uh, less frequent and further apart, I began to really think more deeply about what was it that I was experiencing? Was it nostalgia? Was it, was it something else? You know, what, what, what is this thing 
called wonder. And one of the, um, the, the first realizations, you know, that I came to was that I often confused wonder with spectacle. Spectacle, you know, is when we go and see a fireworks show mm. and those fireworks are beautiful for a moment and then they disappear from the sky. They're shiny, flashy lights and they, they draw our attention, but there's not a lot of substance there and we, we typically don't remember much about it afterwards. We have become a society who uh, is, is very much, I think, addicted to spectacle. We're constantly looking at the next thing to draw our attention, which often has to do with shiny, flashy lights, be they in fireworks or uh, the shiny, flashy lights on the cell phones that we carry around in our pocket. I believe, however, that wonder is an experience that we have that stays with us. We, we tend to recognize that in a moment of wonder, the veil between us and, and something transcendent, something larger than ourselves becomes very thin. That veil becomes very thin in those moments. And I believe that's, that's really what we experience when we experience wonder is we recognize ourselves in the context of a much larger picture, a much larger story, if you will. I, you know, have had those moments walking through the forest and coming upon a waterfall with no one else around. And that certainly is a moment of wonder. But I've also had that moment of wonder more often with other people. You know, when my grandfather took me to Marvel Cave in Missouri and we went down into the depths of this cave, I experienced wonder. And part of that was from what I saw but a larger part of that was because I was experiencing it with my grandfather. So for me, the, these moments um, where we're experiencing something larger than ourselves, we're experiencing the transcendent, they have everything to do with mythology. Because mythology in many ways is trying to get us to that place where we experience the transcendent, where we, we have an idea about something larger, and maybe we can't articulate it, but what we can do is, is construct a metaphor around it. So much of mythology is, you know, the, the, the metaphors that we construct around this idea of the transcendent. Joseph Campbell used to talk about, you know, so often we look at the finger pointing towards the moon, and we're fascinated more by the finger pointing towards the moon than the moon itself. He was interested in the moon and not just uh, the, the metaphor that was pointing towards the moon. And that's a lot harder to talk about. You know, that, that transcendent that the metaphor is pointing towards, that's a lot more difficult to put into words. But I, I think all of us, um, at some point in our lives, uh, whether that be something we can put a name on like God or whether that be something that we choose to to call the universe or the ground of all being, we, we may not believe in any of that. But at some point, we have to make a decision about where we fall in relationship to what Martin Buber called the other, something outside of ourselves. We're talking about the transcendent other, the words you're using Oh, years ago, uh, as you mentioned, walking through the woods and, and experiencing the transcendent was also called the newness or the yes. holy. And I think it also relates to beauty. You uh, wrote this in that article, wonder is delicate. It cannot be forced or generated at will. It can, however, be welcomed. How, John, do we welcome wonder today? What are some ways we can do it? And I'd be interested to hear how you do it. And you maybe want to tell me a little more about constructing that metaphor. How do we do that, John, uh, today? Yeah. Yeah, I, I am a little um, hesitant sometimes to try and uh, bring down the welcoming of wonder into something that um, becomes a little too literal, because I do, I do believe that all of us may do that in a very different way. And that part of our own individual work is finding out how we welcome wonder into the world. I am much more comfortable with talking about how I do it. 
uh, with the caveat that it may not be uh, something that works for everyone. All right. How do you do it? (laughs) Well, here's how I do it. I am someone who really values curiosity. And I am asking myself on a, a weekly basis, where is my curiosity pulled this week? And part of the difficult work of that is sorting out, you know, motivations in your curiosity that, well, is this curiosity just about making me more money? Is this curiosity just about uh, furthering my career? What What is the motivation? And when I can get to the purest form of curiosity that I can, following that curiosity is something that um, has served me well in discovering wonder. Joseph Campbell sort of phrased this in a way that became very popular. He said, follow your bliss. People have taken that word bliss to mean a lot of different things. For me, I, I, I think of that word very similar to curiosity. So I, on a very practical level, one of the things that my partner and I enjoy doing is we enjoy treasure hunting. And what do I mean by treasure hunting? We enjoy treasure hunting at antique stores, at uh, yard sales, estate sales. We really enjoy going and seeing if we can find something that has meaning for us there. Uh, We enjoy collecting things from there. And in many ways, what we do when we go treasure hunting at estate sales and um, antique shops, it's not so much about finding something that will be worth something to us later. It's more about experiencing that feeling of searching on a quite physical and embodied level. Knowing in my body, how does it feel to go search for gold? How does it feel to search for something that is of value to me? And exercising that muscle helps me then to be able to know what it feels like to search for things inside myself on a more metaphoric level. That sort of fulfillment from following your curiosity and just going down the rabbit hole sometimes of of where your psyche may be taking you. I found that to be very, very meaningful. You're almost sort of describing the contemplative life. You are yeah. conscious of what you're doing. You make time for these things. Were, were you that person as a young boy? Did you come into <laughs> that? How, how do you account for that? <laughs> that, that is a, a great question. I, I feel like I always had a curiosity as a young boy. I spent a lot of time in libraries. I grew up in East Texas, and so I I certainly spent a lot of time wandering through the forest. However, I, I do believe it was something that I really had to re-engage once I became an adult and the the weight of life and the, the need to have a job and to pay bills and, you know, relationships. Once all of that becomes a part of your life, I think it's very easy to lose that contemplative life. So I don't know that, you know, our problem is so much that we don't have time to live contemplative lives. I think much of the time, we are searching more for that motivation because we're unsure of what the payoff will be for us. We're afraid more of of wasting our time. And I think in a contemplative life, you you have to be, you have to have a certain level of, of okay with wasting some time. Not everything is going to produce uh, the sort of fruits that um, you know we're we're used to in our society, where we punch a button and everything becomes available to us. There, there's something greater than that. There's something deeper for that, that than that. And I think if we can, you know, return to some of the disciplines of patience uh, that you know societies long before ours came to value, we'll find I think a deeper meaning in life. And I I say all this not as, you know, um, not as a judgment on the world or our culture or anyone listening, but I say this as someone who is trying to do this and who often fails, but someone who is interested in this sort of life. Uh, It's the type of life that I'm attempting to live. I'll be right back with John. I just wanted to say Merry Christmas to you. And thanks for listening to A Small Good Thing in 2019. 
If you would like to leave me a small Christmas present, and I know you would because, well, that's just the kind of person you are, you can do that right now by taking a second to rate the show on your phone or leave a comment. I'd be most grateful. John, here's a big question for you. Okay. Christmas is founded in the story of the birth of the Christ child long, long ago and far, far away. Christians, of course, see that story as a perpetual source of wonder. But here's the thing. When Christians like me, who have read and appreciate the great myths that you've talked about of the Greeks and the Romans Mm -hmm. or the Norse, And then we read the biblical story. Christians, there's a vast difference between those two things. The Bible, the way it's written, reports all the events and characters as history, not fiction. Mm. And yet, and yet, there are also marks in that story of the supernatural, of the miraculous in the story. Mm -hmm. For Christians, the Christmas story is the is the master story, if you will. It's the master myth that supports yeah. all other myths. It is yeah. the myth that is also true. Now, yeah. when I say the, that to you, John, how should we look at the Christmas story? Can, can the Christmas story be both? Can it yeah. be both true or and a myth or Are we forced to choose one or the other? It's either history or it's just a myth. It might Mm. be inspiring. It might be uh, health giving. Uh, It may be very beneficial to us as a myth, but it is not true. And so in the end, we have to ask, does that really matter? How how should we look at the Christmas Mm. story? And as as are we stuck? Here is it going to be either or, and, and <laughs> no, is it, I, can it be a re, can it be a genuine source of wonder without uh, collapsing into sentimentality? <laughs> I am someone who tries to avoid binaries at all costs. I am going to borrow from uh, a great Christian thinker and writer, Father Richard Rohr, who I admire greatly. And he would suggest, he's also a fan of Joseph Campbell, and he he would suggest building on a little bit of Campbell's ideas that in that question, maybe asking the wrong question. I believe that uh, the the story, um, you know, that we uh, hear around Christmas, rather than uh, than saying, you know, is, is it true? I think the answer is it's more than true. This is a story that, that is more than true. In other words, to to quabble about the um, literalism of the story or the historical accuracy of the story is to miss a much, much greater and more profound beauty in this story. So in some ways, for me, having to, to discuss the literalism of the story actually devalues the story. For me, um, I, I I'm not really that worried about that. I'm not really that concerned about that. Um, the the what I take from the story and the uh, the greater truth of the story is so powerful to me. Um, I just can't devalue it like that. So I, I look at this story and I say, this is a story about hope coming from the most unlikely of places. This is about a story about salvation coming when we least expect it, from a place we least expect it, and the form we least expect it. There are are such great and profound and beautiful truths in the Christmas story that transcend Christianity, that transcend you know, any specific tradition we would want to say is owning that tradition. At the same time, my background is also Christianity. I grew up a Christian, and I can embrace that story as part of my own tradition. 
I can embrace that story and practice the, uh, you know, and, and go to uh, a church service uh, that, that honors that story or, or put up a Christmas tree with a star on the top and, and tell the story, you know, of the star that, that led the wise man to the Christ child. I don't think we have to bring this down to the level of, uh, you know, it's either got to be this or that. I, I really believe that we can honor, you know, our own traditions as well as having a larger mythological view of these things. So my opinion would be that we, we can hold one thing in one hand and one thing in another, and we can hold both these things at the same time if that's where we're at, if that's helpful to us. I think if we get into debates about the historical uh, matters, you know, regarding what was written 2,000 years ago, we, we've really missed the point because cultures at that time um, in the, the people of the lower Mesopotamian Valley at that time, they didn't value literalism in the way that we do today. You know, the, the idea of writing from a, uh, a pure historical, truthful level uh, that's that's really something that came along much later in history. That wasn't how people viewed stories. That wasn't how people viewed you know the world. I'm reminded of a, a, a similar story from the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest stories ever told, and it begins talking about a king that ruled for ten thousand years, and. If you look at that story, the people who read didn't believe that that king ruled for 10,000 years. They looked at that story and said, ah, the people there felt like that king had been in power for 10,000 years. And so, so often in our our traditions, in the scriptures of our traditions, we, we rob them of the poetry, of the mysticism, and of the beauty uh, that is therein. And we make them, I think, lesser of lesser value in doing You're right. There is a tension. Richard Rohr emphasizes what he calls the universal Christ. I've read a little bit about him and listened to his podcast. I think he gets things right that many Christians miss. Um, Sometimes, for me, he floats a little bit too far. Sure. Uh, Opposite of a guy like Richard Rohr might be somebody like St. Paul. St. Paul, in the end, was sort of a steely-eyed realist. Paul's right. own words were, you know, if Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead, then Christians are pitiable people. So for Paul, <laughs> there had to be this element of actuality. Right. And I think that probably is the orthodox view of Christianity. Yet, I take what you're saying and what Richard Rohr and to a certain degree, a person like Jordan Peterson are saying, and that is there is this there is this aspect of myth that floats in and amongst that reality. I guess, John, for me, what I would say is, yes, the universal Christ, and yes, Jesus. It's Christ yeah. and Jesus. And Jesus, yeah. of course, is always the scandal. He's, he's particular. Yeah. He's that yeah. man. Whereas um, Christ is a little bit harder to lay our hands on. And so for me, there's that always going to be that tension between the universal Christ and that particular man that was born at Christmas. Oh, I I just want to say I greatly enjoy talking about these things. And I think in some ways, these discussions that you and I are having, Steve, are in many ways the point. Uh, one of the, the traditions I have, one of the greatest appreciations for is uh, the the Jewish tradition. In the Jewish tradition, they have this concept of the Midrash. And, you know, in the Midrash, yes. uh, we we get to debate these things and we get to discuss them and pull back and forth. And, you know, the point is is never to, to come to conclusion even necessarily. It's the point is the discussion. The point is the back and forth. And um, I, I think that is is one of the greatest things that we could do, um, you know, in, in trying to uh, wrestle with these ideas. So I, I am honored to to be a, a, a co-wrestler on your wrestling team on this podcast today. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, John. I wish you the very best. Happy New Year. And we'll yes. stay in touch. Thank you, my friend. It's always good to talk to you.